an immensity of ice, hostile, alien, barren. Such is the north the south perceives, but look closer. New voices, new ideas are shaping a new north. There's an onrush of change, a breakthrough in technology and lifestyle. The Arctic world is altering faster than our perception of it. This is the story of a circumpolar journey of 30,000 miles across seven nations, the personal odyssey of author Farley Mowat. The North is dear to me and always calls me back. I've written many books about it, a score of them all told, but there's still much to tell. So many profound changes in the ancient world of the Inuit and the Sami and the Chukchi. <laughs> is the shared backyard of the world's most advanced nations, where the unity of nature makes shared values and objectives vital. So what exactly is happening in this vast backyard that the rest of us so seldom see? Soviet Union, beginning with the new Siberia. Siberia is far east, in the province of Chukotka. Physically, it is ten times closer to the U.S. mainland than to Moscow. Ecologically, a shared world, a unity of nature, if not man. The same ocean, the same migrating wildlife, the same cultural origins, make for one world in all but ideology. Southerners imagine some vast, frozen no-man's land. Northerners see a true Mediterranean, central to the common future. Our journey begins at Pevek, eastern Siberia. Pevek, once one of Stalin's gulags, is now the newest port city serving the Arctic sea routes, repopulated after huge discoveries of placer gold. For Farley Mowat, making his third Siberian visit, Pevek is all new. Well, almost. We're met at the airport by an orange bus of inscrutable ancestry, a kind of happy-looking hearse. In it, we would jolt across the Siberian tundra on exploratory journeys from our base at Pevek the first Westerners to film in this region. In Pevek, we are to rendezvous with an old friend, a native Chukchi, Yuri Ritkiu. Yuri is a prominent Soviet author who has also written for National Geographic. He's a popular writer in many northern countries. And Yuri is my old traveling companion from previous visits in the late 60s. And I haven't seen him for 20 years. That's it, Andy. That's the hotel. That's the Ritz Pevac. And where's Yuri? I don't see him. No sign of Yuri. My God, you don't suppose he didn't come? Oh, he's got to be here somewhere. No, nothing doing. No Yuri. Uh, wait, wait, wait. There he is. There he is. Yuri! Remember 20 years ago? 20 years ago. You said you'd give me your hat if I came back? Yes. I get it. I get it. You're his hat. Oh, I have. There you go. I want to see these palatial quarters that you have reserved for me. Here. Let's go. And maybe we can find a little uh, something? Yes. All good, good, good. It is the old Yuri, the same warmth of welcome. But there's a new morality and a certain spirit is missing instead of vodka tea 
chai, his favorite drink in Tandra. Uh, all northern uh, people drink chai. Chai, and uh, just after anti-alcoholic movement, it is the best drink. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else to drink anymore. <laughs> ah, very difficult to find in Tandra now. Uh, now we are both became uh, elder. Mm -hmm. A little older. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> maybe a little wiser. I doubt that. <laughs> and also, um, nos. Uh, change very much uh, in comparison to what we saw almost 20 years, years ago. ago. So much has changed as Moet could testify. 20 years ago he saw another town, Chersky, then the most remote in this Arctic coastal region. Then almost empty streets, buildings made of wood, generally primitive conditions. Now, in Pevik, I'm seeing a town which began its growth at the same time, and to my mind, it's a startling accomplishment. A place of impressive achievements and surprises, and some familiar faces. In 1967, Pevek was a collection of wooden shacks. Even the docks were made of wood. The cargo loaded and unloaded by hand. Now I find an ultra-modern port with a population of 12,000 and a sophisticated lifestyle. This is the really high Arctic. So about the last thing you'd expect is a herd of milk-giving cows. These animals are bred from stock originally developed by Peter the Great. And now these Arctic cattle are as much at home on the tundra as the caribou. For Moet's team, the surprises have just begun to unfold. Vegetable gardens on the tundra, competitively tended by workers' groups using surplus heat and power. There's variety and abundance, almost enough, it's said, for the city's needs. In Pevek, I'm reminded of how little we know of the Arctic we share. The West clings to its cartoon images of how the Russian people look. Yet the people of Pevek look and dress very much like the people I see on the streets of Port Hope, my home in Canada. But when Yuri proudly suggests a visit to a local department store, I don't expect much. Preconceptions take some shaking. Hey, it's a big store, eh? Oh. Hey, these are, these are neat looking little things. Iron dogs. Iron dogs. Iron right. dogs. Iron tundra dogs. Uh, not so expensive. 145. Uh, 145 rubles. That's no, about so. uh, 300 dollars, Canadian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so. Good, good. Let's go and look at the cameras. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you like this camera? I like all kinds of cameras. What's How about uh, video equipment and? Uh, Sorry, not yet. Not yet. No not video yet. equipment yet. Not okay. Yet. Not yet. How about uh, radios and televisions and things like that? that? Okay, let's go and see. That's it. How much do these sets cost? Okay, yeah. About 300 uh, rubles. Yes, for a big one. It, uh, black and white. Yeah. But there yeah. is no this one color. Oh, yeah. I think. So, lots of television sets. Everybody has one, I noticed. Yes. Uh, which one do you want? Mmm, that's very pretty. For Claire? Yeah, for Claire. Mmm. That's a pretty one too. Yeah. At the Chukutsky gold. Is it Chukutka gold? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> where where is all the Chukutka gold? A kuda же с Chukutsky золота уходит? Mmm, разные страны. Уже за Gone somewhere else, eh? Mm-hmm. Siberian gold. On previous visits, Moat had heard of fabulous new gold finds near Pavec, a city that had risen on gold like some Canadian Klondike. After three long hours bouncing over alpine plains that the reindeer herdsmen call the Golden Pastures, we came to a lunar eruption of sterile gravel. Coming nearer, we recognized it as the tailings of a vast placer dredging operation. For 30 minutes, we drove through this industrial vomit. That's how vast it is before reaching the perpetrator, dredge number 187. It swims 
swims in its own murky lake, roaring and belching like the monster it is. In the 20 years of its existence, it has chewed its way across 13 kilometers of muskeg and reindeer pasture and gulped down a once pretty tundra river, excreting five square kilometers of gravel. From this air-cooled nuclear reactor at Bilibino, power is brought overland to the gold dredge 125 kilometers away, where it frees the gold from ground that has been frozen through all of human history. And so, slowly, the tundra melts in this new moiling for gold. Imagine the effort and the patience it will require, for the gold layers are said to wind for 200,000 kilometers. I wanted to meet the people directly involved, the dredge crew. They haven't come north to hustle a quick ruble, well, a, then leave. He They're here to make the Siberian Arctic their own country, their new world. Perhaps they've come because they can have a better life here than what they left behind, but the fact is they and their families have voluntarily come, and they're going to stay. Are you going to stay here all your life? <laughs> Uh, he's married, he has son. Then his wife will make the decision. But this is the main decision. Why? We make the decision together. <laughs> Thank you all very much for inviting me to your address. And, and when I get tired of writing and need a job, I'll come here. Если он устанет и захочет что переменить работу или ему понадобится работа, он приедет сюда работать. The alluvial gold fields of Chukotka are believed to be so vast that to exploit them quickly would take 50 such dredges. And that's probably how it would be done in the North American Arctic, given the same riches. The Canadian Yukon is witness to that. But the Soviets have opted for slow, long-term development designed to create permanent Arctic communities. Even so, the damage to the tundra here may take nature a thousand years to repair. Not having hidden his distaste for the environmental devastation, Moat has taken to a reclamation area. He has seen the mess created, and now he sees how the many acres of tailings are being leveled off. The silt and gravel fertilized for a special strain of grass developed for Arctic conditions. Here, several hundred miles above the Arctic Circle, there's a green miracle above the gold. Now, I understand that in a good year, this uh, hay or oats or whatever it is grows I up to your knees, eh? And you know, almost almost it is ready, you know, for the crops. <laughs> but this summer it's very cold. But they tell me that somebody else is enjoying it. Please, Please show me who these people are. Moat is happiest to find that the area wildlife, little arctic ground squirrels, have come boldly back. The local guides seem not to mind. Enough grass here for everybody, they say. Yuri didn't come with us to see the hayfield. He remained brooding on the bus, questioning the physical destruction of his land. I remembered what he had said earlier at the dredge. It's the sound of the earth crying out in pain. Yuri's concern for the land has deep roots. He was born of it and on it, in a skin tent in this village, Uellen. Even in the polar world, Uellen is remote. It's at the extreme eastern tip of Siberia, only 300 kilometers from Alaska. Yuri wrote of these beginnings for the National Geographic. For each person, the world begins where he himself first appeared, and the rest of mankind begins with him. I can remember when our whole life was bound up with the sea. Early on summer mornings, the hunters set off among the drifting ice flows to chase the walrus and whale. The skins became our dwellings, roof, walls, and floor. And the sledge runners made of walrus tusk slid easily over the ice. Our entire view of the world, our philosophy, 
legends and songs were linked with the sea and its animals. These legends remain in the depths of my soul, filling me with a sense of mysterious community. When the hunt is successful, we would hold a big ritual whale festival, a celebration of thanksgiving to the gods of the sea. of the Soviet Arctic remain inexorably bound to their homeland. For us, the return to our native soil is always a return to that point from which we see the world. Yuri speaks for all the indigenous Arctic peoples. In the Soviet Union alone, he is the voice of 300,000 natives belonging to a score of ethnic groups scattered across an area greater than Western Europe. The next day, Yuri is able to show what the living tundra means to him. He takes Farlimot to some camps of the Chukchi still reindeer herders, still preserving a lifestyle of 4,000 years. Yuri had come home. The lifestyle uh, of the tundra is, is very close to the nature. It changed very few, maybe millenniums. You know, the shape of Iraq is the same. Mm -hmm. The material is the same. The material is mostly the same. And uh, the lifestyle at the same way like many, many, uh, maybe 100 years ago. Yura, you are back in the Yuranga. You were born in the Yuranga. Yes, I was born in the Yuranga. What's A little here? bit the other type, but um, the, my feeling is very strange because, you know, it's like to step to my childhood, mm -hmm. to my old life. So you have to come here. To recapture your childhood. I don't, uh, even I don't compare uh, my feeling with happiness. It's more important feeling <laughs> than happiness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, there any, is there any hope for them to continue this way of life? No, I can't we to continue this to Yes, they hope. Wouldn't uh, she prefer to live in a nice big concrete apartment house? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Yeah, there is a flat in the village. Mm -hmm. She has mm -hmm. a modern flat. But she prefers to live here. In the remotes of Siberia, the helicopter takes Moed back in time and forward. The old lifestyle very much serves the present as he discovers in searching for the reindeer herds. Watching these magnificent animals, so closely related to the Canadian caribou I know so well, is a moving experience. It's also a revelation that in the Siberian North such good use can be made of the country and in a natural way. How many are in that herd, do you think? Here? Uh, Out there? Uh, about uh, 3,000. These herds, totaling some two million animals, provide meat for the Soviet Union and employment for the large northern minorities. In my own country, the Arctic peoples have no such economic opportunity based on the land except trapping, and that's a dying trade. It would take guts, energy, and intelligence for the Canadian government to duplicate what's been done here, but it is achievable. Reindeer herds in Alaska were successful, and 50 years ago, deer were actually introduced in the Mackenzie Delta area and Canada's far north. 
but the experiment was never given a chance to thrive. Hey, we have arrived. We have arrived. We have arrived. At yeah. last, we're really on the Chukchi land. And look at all these beautiful women. Yeah. These days, the reindeer herdsmen of Siberia live in two worlds. They spend their summers in the Yarangas, the nomadic tent communities of the tundra, and their winters in brick villages like Raikuchi, remote but modern. <laughs> Uh, I asked her about uh, uh, what is uh, her job here, but mm -hmm. she told me the story. I am already grandmother, one of the old lady on pension. <laughs> Doesn't have to work. <laughs> well, maybe since we are both uh, pensioners together, we can uh, get together. We can live together. Ну если вот мы вот соединим пенсии две, может мы вместе будем жить? Central authority keeps them nationally aware, and one way of reaching out is through books. The Raikuchi is as remote as you can get, its population no more than 750. Farley Mode finds here a great many fans. Twelve of his 28 titles have been translated into Russian. His themes and concerns about the endangered North are familiar here. Moet's guide, Yuri, though he now lives in Leningrad, is the poet hero of the Chukchi. Another, you know, nobody's going to believe this back in Canada. They'll think that we, we organized this, and that we brought these books and set the whole thing up. So please tell the audience that it's really true. Okay, it's true. Yeah. Uh, it's my turn. Your turn. You're uh, where you go. The revolution in modernity seems not to have been at the expense of heritage. Raikuchi School is a mini museum for the expression of Chukchi art and culture. Wherever he traveled in Siberia, Moet found superb educational facilities for the minorities. The poster art is particularly interesting. These kids are encouraged to think about social problems that will affect them all when they're growing up. And not just domestic problems. The issues of world peace are as much a concern out here on the tundra as they are in Moscow or in Montreal. These classrooms contain other relevant messages, such as the importance of the land and the vital need to protect it. During the school year, the children come in from the tundra, communally cared for, with strict hygiene. <laughs> well, these, these children have just, just arrived in from the tundra. Yes, just one day. One day. Uh -huh. Yesterday. Uh, you explained to me that... Their parents join them when the reindeer move to winter pastures, but in the meantime, they are always in touch. Uh, uh, sometimes they can uh, communicate with parents by radio, uh -huh. by radio telephone. Uh -huh. And uh, each year, beginning of September, came uh, medical, people. medical people to check them for TB mm -hmm. or other... Any diseases, yes. right. Give them a full physical yes, checkup. Uh, it's a con uh, contemporary... Method. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The new way. New way. In the new north. In new north. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Though reared in tradition, the local Chukchi children happily tune in to the technology of hands, our sound band.
Probably they're a good deal more excited about our visit than about performing a traditional Chukchi folk dance out on the wind-blown tundra. But we wanted to see it, and so dance they do. A Chukchi lady named Nina composed this music and trained the dance group. She had East and West laughing together. Receiving these beads brought back memories of a North I'd first encountered 50 years ago. A North whose native peoples were legendary for their hospitality, for their generosity. And here, that kind of North is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Nearby, the old nomadic work life serves a broader population, as well as national needs. At first glance, it seems to be an abandoned prospector's camp, a collection of tar paper huts. But the huts are built on skids so they can be dragged by tractor across the tundra. The old ways of the Oranga have been adapted for some ingenious tin mining. The machinery and methodology varies from old to ancient. But the spirit of the camp is in mint condition. The reason he's adding hot water to that, I think, yes. is because that's frozen, that's permafrost. Yes, yes, permafrost. Just, just come out of the ground and it's fully frozen. Special secrets of Soviet technology. <laughs> okay. The whole ambience here, the joviality, the rough hue and friendliness, reminds me of the turn of the century Canadian North. That's the same kind of pan that they've used for 500 years. I think so. Prospecting this way, they have taken hold of their north, and it has taken hold of them. Shades of Robert Service. It grips you like some kind of sinning. It twists you from foe to a friend. It seems it has been since the beginning. It seems it will be to the end. He finds gold uh, by accident. What do we do? <laughs> he keeps it. <laughs> they found the first tin showing on the surface, and they've been drilling all through this valley for four years, and they finally found a commercial body, a viable body of tin ore, enough to make all the tin cans in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Everywhere we flew across Chukotka, I was dismayed to see a tracery of scars left by the passage of machines. Wounds on the tundra that may not heal for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. we visited reflects the mystery which is so much a part of Chukotka. In this mystical place, Yuri and our guide Mikhail and I share a sense of unity, of being northerners together. These enormous monoliths, some of them a hundred feet in height, rear up out of an unbelievably ancient land, dwarfing us, making mock of our pretensions. Kakuri is an unexpected highlight of our visit. But the day still has surprises for sound man hands.
Uh, best wishes on occasion of the birthday, Vladimir. <laughs> outlying visits becomes a more recognizable achievement. Center of a new north, not just for the native peoples, but for scores of nationalities from all over the Soviet Union who have come here to stay. In the, the north now, there is a new population uh, came here from the other part of the world and the other part of the, our country, and they already became as an indigenous people here mm -hmm. and uh, is already next generation of the newcomers lives here. A priority is daycare. There are 15 such centers in Pevek alone, some of them caring for more than 100 children. These, these are all yours? All your children? Party propaganda. That's how my Toronto producers reacted to the fancy dresses, bows, and teacups. But my previous visits to Siberia make me disagree. These are the children of a new era, most of them born here. They'll probably spend their entire lives here by choice. This is their world. An example, the Badmaya family. The mother is Chukchi. Her husband, a Beriat, a native of temperate southern Siberia. They tried living in his hometown, but as she tells Moat, it was too hot in the summer and too many trees, so they settled in Pevek. She's a clerk, he's a mechanic on a reindeer cooperative. But their son, Sasha, born and raised here, is of the professions. You're going to be a doctor? Doctor. Ah, a psychologist. Psychologist? But where will you go? Will you go north or will you go to Moscow or Leningrad? No, I could have a Moscow, Leningrad, and the Sever. Yeah, the Sever. To the north. <laughs> to the north. Good man. <laughs> but with the influx of newcomers, what will become of the ancient cultures of the Soviet north? Moet's guide, Yuri, remembers as a young man a village joke about the typical Arctic family father, mother, two children, and a researcher. Today, Yuri insists, there's no need for concern. Many minority groups have grown in population, their folklore and unique knowledge of the North contributing to the survival of all. Today, Yuri doubts not those who come, but those who left. But aren't you yourself an example of what is happening, the cultural dissolution of the of the native culture of Chukotka. Uh, you grew up, you were born in a Yeranga. Yeah. You grew up there in your younger years. And then you went to Leningrad to study and you really have never gone back to live. You have changed from one culture to another. You have been very successful in the Western culture. Uh, isn't this the obvious logical pattern of the future for all native people? Mm, I don't think so because what uh, well, uh, first of all, what is this uh, real success in life? I don't know. I don't know. I have, uh, okay, I have maybe what is a financial success or uh, public success. But nobody knows what I feel inside me. Because instead of to be happy, uh, I feel uh, more, very much doubt. Maybe all my life I was in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. That is a brave thing to admit. <laughs> Not many of us can do that. The posters proclaim a literary evening with Farley Mowat. Though his books have sold 10 million copies in over 30 languages, Moat is from a nation where the bookworm is an endangered species. In Canada, a literary evening might fetch a dozen or so, 
In Pevek, Siberia, Mowat fills the town hall. Traditional bread and salt welcome, and a room full of questions. What first drew him to the north? And by the time the war ended, I had lost my faith in mankind. I could not believe that there was much good in a species that would spend so much energy killing itself. But my visit to the Achiramu, mm the uh, Inuit people, restored my faith in my own species. So the least I could do for them was to try and help them in their bad times. The first big surprise was to open my window and hear an animal on the tundra that went Moo! <laughs> they ask about hockey, about Western family life, about his first impressions on previous visits, and about the ways of the North elsewhere. Canada is the mankind of hockey. Okay. Oh, da, yes. da, da. Wayne Gretzky. Yes. But Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> you need <Mike>. my. <laughs> <laughs> sign, sign. Okay. Did you? Okay, here you are. You can sign one. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, ah, you're on, guys. the Arctic Ocean is not a backwater, it is a great natural resource, not least for commerce. What they plan here is the fabled dream of the Northwest Passage, but it will be the Northeast Passage with Pevek its gateway. Soon this deep sea port may loom large on the world map. If two ships set out by competing routes from the Far East to Europe, one via the Orient and Suez, the other across the Northern Sea, the northerner would be well ahead. The Soviets were the first to chart a navigable route more than 50 years ago. This exploration opened Siberia to greater internal trade. The plan now, and it's more reality than ambition, is to open the new north to global shipping, and thus, of course, increase Soviet global influence. Since this 1934 voyage, the Soviets have steadily led in ice navigation. In Pevek, Moat has shown how the Soviets are navigating through their northeast passage for eight months a year, and they're attempting to do so year round. Their hopes rest on a new fleet of super icebreakers. This is where you gather all the information about ice and weather, yes. and put it all together and make your decisions where the vessels go? Yes, right, yeah. On this map, you see the ice situation at the present time. In appropriate places, the icebreakers will wait for some ships and take them through the high ice fields. Havek 
was blocked by ice just now. The icebreaker, Admiral Makarov, who we are waiting for, is coming through the ice to the pack. And in a short time, he will be moored, and then we load our equipment on it, and then begin to go to the ice fields and make your chop. The invitation comes on Moet's last day in Siberia. And it's a sign of Soviet confidence that Moat and his crew are told that the Admiral Makarov is all theirs for the day. They can sail where they like, that is, out into the polar ice pack. Ah, what a beautiful ship. <laughs> There's the feeling of boarding a luxury cruise liner, although the Makarov is by no means the best, only medium-sized. Some of the Soviet icebreaker fleet is built in Finland, but it is the commitment that's important. Canada is about to build an equally sophisticated icebreaker. But the Soviets, with different commercial objectives, remain unrivaled in ice navigation. For me, this is the realization of a boyhood dream. I have always loved ships and the North, and this voyage would bring the two together in the best possible way. Part of the thrill is the realization that the right people can be drawn North if they're given the wherewithal to do their stuff. Of Scandinavia, the tundra is the same. And we need then unity in the north. 
Yes, it is his, our slogan. That our would be slogan. the slogan then of the third Canadian Chukchi Siberian expedition. Right. Got it. Right. One day I'll be back, Yuri. I learn a little more each time I come. But I've still got a long way to go on this circumpolar journey. Glimpses of a vanishing world. The Sami of northern Scandinavia have a lineage of at least 6,000 years. The Sami are descendants of the Laps, hunters, who became herders, but they remain a people of the deer. Always their culture and economy have centered on the reindeer. Now, suddenly, both the deer and their keepers are a threatened species. The Samis are a trinity of man, animal, and land. As such, they've endured as a people. Even domesticated deer need the tundra, but each year the Sami have lost more and more of the land to commercial interests. So each year the number of herdsmen declines. Now no more than 10% of the 50,000 Sami population. The Samis, who for so long have wrestled nature, are no match for governments or big business or even that other form of domesticated animal. The tourist. This is Nordkap in Norway, Europe's northernmost land point, 400 miles above the Arctic Circle. The paradox here, the sightseeing destroys what they've come to see. The Sami lands stretch south from Nordkap across to the top of Norway, Sweden and Finland. It's a region warmed by the Gulf Stream where the tourists descend like shock waves. They flock here from all over the world. At Nordkap alone, more than 200,000 people each year swarm where the reindeer once roamed. They come to see the midnight sun, but I've come to see the tourists. Much of the grazing land has become paved asphalt leading to the midnight sun. In Sweden, there's the anomaly of ferry boats bringing in tourists, while other ferries take the reindeer to pastures that the tourists haven't yet reached. While some of the Sami herdsmen go to these extraordinary lengths, others, caught in the paradox, have perforce joined the tourist business. The Samis have had to learn to exploit the exploiters with these shoddy roadside stands, and it's demeaning. Scandinavian governments have acquiesced in throwing the reindeer people to the tourist wolves. But in central Sweden, Moet finds a reconstructed Sami village where the purpose is to educate the tourists. It's the work of an indomitable Sami lady, Maud Matson. With the help of several Sami families, she has turned 20 acres of woods and pasture land into a reserve where traditional Sami lifestyle can flourish. Her idea is to save Sami culture by making it understandable to southern Scandinavians. So, I think I must be back in Canada. This is the mm -hmm. kind of tent that our Indians used to build on the yeah, prairie. Yeah, and we knew the teepee. Yeah. But the smoke hole is too big. Yeah, it has become too big here. So we take here for, for the shoes. Mm-hmm. You dry that, yeah. and it's marvelous and, and in the make shoes it in winter. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Grass socks. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all one piece except for this, eh? No. Uh -huh. You take pieces out, so. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. and here one piece. We do Very it comfortable. in the evenings in winter. No television? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, we do. Look. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. A little bit. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> At Ore in central Sweden, the Sami leaders gather for a crisis conference. The industrial world, they say, is out of control. Delegate Ole Henrik Maga. We understand what the needs are for the world today to have resources, but there is an end to it. 
because this world is turning mad. We're destroying it. Everybody knows today that we're destroying it. And you see the Sami way of using the resources. That's the only sound way to do it, because it's uh, the way that you can use the land and waters and uh, we don't have to spoil everything. With a deliberate ring of irony, the Sami national anthem echoes over the slopes of Ore, a ski resort built on land expropriated from them. The Tundra people had chosen this bastion of the invading southerners as the location for the 12th Nordic Sami Conference. This was to have been a consciousness-raising exercise to reinforce their belief and hopes that they can survive as an ethnic entity. These are a resolute people. Their battle may be a hopeless one, but you can read in their faces and hear in their voices that it's not one they will likely forsake. Their legal counsel, Lars Nila Lasko, makes the wider context. I think we have a great message, uh, we, the Aboriginal people around the world, to, to uh, the European countries and American countries uh, of uh, the natural way of, of living and living with the uh, nature. And that's uh, very important for your life. I think that we, we must have some time now to, to see, to, to organize the Sami people internally. And then comes time to look forward to see where really limits are. And uh, I don't think anybody here in, in these meetings is blind to see there are limits. The struggle to control tourism, the fight to establish a Sami homeland, become minor issues at this conference. For a new danger has suddenly appeared, one that threatens every aspect of the Sami way of life. Nuclear radiation. A catastrophe descends out of the darkness of a rainy winter sky, a silent, unseen killer revealed only later, the fallout from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster. The usually festive annual roundup becomes a nightmare. Norway and Sweden each destroy 50,000 contaminated deer. Much of the tundra will be unusable for at least a generation. It was a very big uh, disaster because they have lived here for several thousands of years and they had on one night to change uh, their lifestyle. They couldn't eat the blueberry, they couldn't walk, walk in the wood area. They can't eat the reindeer meat. They can't eat the fish in the rivers. I think the Sami feel this very, very bitter anger on this Chernobyl accident. I couldn't for a long time, don't, I didn't understand that we could not eat the meat and sell the meat. What about the future? Will, uh, will it be possible to, for this pasture, for your reindeer pasture, will it recover? I was so hopeful. I had thought we could uh, give the reindeer uh, special eating, mm -hmm. and so it could be very good in one, two months, so we can sell the meat as normal. And anyway, I th have thought about it, but now I think it is clear that we are not allowed to do this. You must be angry as a people. You can't really believe it, that uh, such a things can happen when we don't have not taken anything, always give out and from the country and that such a things can happen to the reindeers. We listen to the voice.
voices. They are there now still. Maybe they will die out. And then what are the ch chances then for the mankind? Not only for us, the Samis, the Indians, the Inuit people, the Norwegians, Swedes, Americans, whatever they call themselves, what are the chances? If we don't start to think now, we do have a chance. And now is the time. The darkest shadows are of our own making. The fate of the Sami cannot be seen in isolation. Their fate could foreshadow everyone's. What's needed, not only in the New North, but everywhere, is a new morality to protect our planet and us all. There is a place where the world of the glacier and the fjord and the ice hunter of old coexist in harmony with the modern age. This is Greenland. For this part of his polar journey, Mowat is joined by his wife, Claire. I remember 1982, but I can't remember back to 1974. They are approaching a land that is six-sevenths ice, where the glaciers are three kilometers thick in places, the largest island in the world. Greenland is the most northerly nation. Its capital, called Nuuk, administers a population of 50,000, mostly Inuit. Greenland, compared to the beleaguered Sami, has a native population much the same size, but vigorous, strong, with good prospects of survival in the modern world. Its character is very much that of this man, author, cabinet minister, co-founder of the Greenland Independence Party, and my friend, Akaluk Ling. Greenland is uh, situated uh, geographically uh, that way, so it's separated uh, from North America and, uh, and uh, from Europe. And the uh, Greenlandic people have always had, had that in their mind, that uh, they can do it uh, themselves, that uh, we can support ourselves. But uh, the uh, situation has changed uh, since the uh, World Second World War. So uh, now we get uh, a lot of aid, uh, financial support from Denmark, from outside. from. So we are dependent on that. Though still a possession of Denmark, Greenland in 1979 was granted home rule. That is, full autonomy except in defense and foreign affairs. A quarter of the population is Danish. Their influence still strongly reflected in the lifestyle of the Greenlanders. Even so, the goal of one flag, of a fully autonomous Inuit nation, is logical, says Ling. Our nation uh, have one language and uh, one cultural uh, background and uh, we are developing into a kind of uh, society that, that is both modern and traditional. A strong reaffirmation of tradition is the hunt of whale, caribou and seal. Their argument for this is partly economic, but mainly it is identity. It is part of their national cloth, Claire Moat is told. Akaluk's wife, Erna, explains how the skins are cleaned. She's taking the last fat of the seal skin with her ulu. When she's finished with this process, uh, they used to wash the skin maybe five or six times yeah. uh, until the smell goes off. What do you call this kind of seal? We call it a harp seal, harp seal. in Canada. Yeah, and it, uh, it has been washed uh, six times yes. and then dried. For Greenland, the dilemma is how to use, not abuse, their resources. To take what they need and no more from the land and sea. For now, they need export revenue, but the aim is to become economically self-sufficient. 
Housing is a simple example of what home rule means. Now they build for permanence and individuality. The imprint of the outsider, the imported prefab that denotes the Canadian North and the foreign high-rise, had smudged the landscape. Akalak Ling is Minister of Housing. 90% of uh, our uh, housing is uh, funded by the government. It's so expensive uh, up here in the Arctic to uh, uh, whatever kind of construction you have, so uh, uh, we have to subsidize it. And I notice there's a difference, an enormous difference in the kind of building that you're using now. When we came here in 74, we were horrified by that gigantic structure that looks like a skyscraper lying on its side. I know it, it always makes me feel a strong sense of sadness when I walk by and I see from a fourth floor balcony uh, a piece of reindeer meat drying. And I think, my God, whoever trapped these people in these little boxes? But that's what we are trying to stop. We have been through so many changes in our lives. We have been uh, put uh, from snow huts uh, in, into uh, the, these big uh, apartments. And uh, now they are trying to change our lives so we can't hunt. We can't go out uh, hunting uh, mi uh, million of seals out, out here. We can't uh, hunt, uh, hunt uh, whales. Because we are pressed uh, and terrorized by uh, environmentalists and conservation groups that never seen uh, a seal. And uh, the only thing that uh, the uh, Southern can, can understand that uh, we change our diet. Why don't you uh, just eat, uh, you know, uh, beef? Uh, why don't you just eat chicken? Why don't you eat uh, vegetables? Well, we don't have it. And it's so expensive to have airplanes uh, coming with, uh, with these uh, vegetables. And what, uh, where we should we have the cash if we can't uh, hunt seals and sell a seal skin? Maybe uh, the seal is uh, in danger outside of California, but not here. Never. The seals may not be endangered in Greenland, but that is not at issue. The environmental movement has no desire to take away the livelihood of native peoples. It is a large-scale exploit of hunters and fishermen that the environmentalists want to control. Without such action, there will simply be no seals, no whales or wildlife left. And then people like the Greenlanders, who must live on the bounty of the sea and the land, would be forced to abandon their lifestyle and their culture. Here you have the caribou. Oh, look at that. Marvelous, beautiful. Take. How do you manage to surround yourself by so many beautiful women? What's the secret? The secret is secret. <laughs> Our hostess, Akalak's wife, Erna, exemplifies the new Greenlander. Fiercely traditional, but modern. She is a television producer and is active in her husband's independence party, both avenues for advancing women's rights. But always she has an eye for the past and for the land. This land, this great island, had begun to lose touch with the sea during the generation of the 50s and 60s. Much like Canadian policy, the Danish administrators pressured the people to move from the outports into large population centers. They were divorced from the vitality of the land, and centralization quickly led to one of the world's highest rates of alcoholism, venereal disease, and suicide. Equally tragic, they began to lose their connections with the past, but now there's a massive attempt at restoration, as we discovered when we sailed into one fjord we thought was empty. It's a beautiful place, but what, what are all these kids doing here? Where did they come from? Is this a, a summer camp? It is uh, uh, within the curriculum of uh, our schools all over in Greenland. So uh, we have this kind of abandoned settlements, uh, we have hundreds of them in Greenland. Mm -hmm. yes, and uh, so uh, nearly uh, 20 years ago we started to use them. So all the schools have uh, uh, their own settlement. Mm -hmm. So they go there, uh, every class uh, uh, go there in the summertime. 
and in the fall time for one week. And what do they do here? They uh, go out fishing. They uh, learn the history why we abandoned these places, and uh, they have the feeling of of history. They have the feeling of of uh, land, country, because. Uh, uh, we stay in, 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 a, in a big place mm -hmm. with uh, 12,000 people mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, we are living like in a city. So uh, the kids have to go out and learn uh, how to behave themselves. somebody's clothes, clothes line. So, for a brief time, the children stay in the ancestral villages, learning about the land and the wildlife, discovering their own beginnings. Perhaps someday people will return here as modern settlers attuned to nature. The winter night never quite ends in Canada's far, far north, yet there's heavy industry year-round. This blue moonscape is a sealed-in zinc mining complex at the tip of Baffin Island. Its name, Nana Civic, a study in southern ways in minus 40 conditions. The cold isn't bad. We're, we're not outside much. We more or less just go from, the, from our home to, to work and back. So we're not getting our fresh air. But other than that, we don't notice the cold much. I hate it. <laughs> the coldness is just too much. <laughs> it, it's really hard. I think the longer you're here, the worse it gets to. It just seems to get right into your bones. <laughs> but over 10 years, thousands of workers, southerners and natives have shared this industrial igloo. When the zinc runs out, perhaps by 1991, a great riddle will remain. Mine manager, Jack Haynes. In the opening days of the project, of course there was no community of Nana Civic. It was uh, looked at as a pilot project. We've done some things here that were very unique. Uh, the fact that we have a community here, uh, as opposed to some of the more recent developments in the, in the Arctic that uh, are really operated as camps, fly-in type basis single status. Uh, I, I think when the mine opened, even knowing that we only had several years reserves, uh, the infrastructure was put here to be permanent. The infrastructure may be permanent, but it has little to do with living in the Canadian Arctic. Miner Bob Carroll. It's like a cocoon. The company takes care of everything. We don't have any real, you know, I mean, they, they give us a hot meal every day. They, all we have to do is pay our telephone bill, you know. You don't have to worry about transportation. There's no hardships. Mining the ice ore, 600 lonely kilometers above the Arctic Circle, takes guts and stamina. To what end? Soviet exploitation of their Arctic can be environmentally damaging, but at the worst, it's part of a better whole. A Siberian Nana Civic would fit into a wider plan of truly permanent settlement. Of course, Canadians face different circumstances, but even so, a new approach seems badly needed. Zinc is a roofing material, and a year here can bring up to $50,000. It's a real opportunity in more than one ways, you know. I think it, it's good for us. It's good for the family unit because we, I think we get to be a little tighter, you know. There's not, uh, not so much to do outside, so we look for our entertainment within. And that sounds funny, eh? but that's true. <laughs> A 
Culturally, this is hardly common ground. It's southern convenience. Will it tempt the Inuit kids to abandon the north? That's what worries me. But in fairness, people like daycare worker Pam Weiss see it as more than just a job. Nanasivik can be a very uh, opportune place if you have that tendency to, uh, to want to participate and get involved. And I, I, I'm the type of person that likes to get involved in anything that I, you know, that's going or, or any opportunities. So for me, it's been good. Well, I, I teach Sunday school, and that's, you know, that's been a real pleasure for me. I show the kids the movies Friday nights. We tried to start a drama club, but it didn't go over too well. But uh, we had a newspaper going, too, for a while, and I was in that. So there's things like that that I probably wouldn't get to do down south. So, so I think if you want to do things like that, you can, it's a good chance to break into things. This is a north conditioned by the south. In Canada's resource industries, the boom and bust cycle has long been a fact of life. The question is whether it's accepted too easily. Miner Mike Delay. This is how mining works. You go there and you mine until the ore is gone and then you move out. It's not only northern Canada, this is the way mining has been done right through Canada. You go to southern Canada or anywhere else, this mining community will probably be like any other mining community. It'll probably just disappear like so many others have. I guess the Inuits in Arctic Bay will come out like us, dependent on uh, your paycheck every week and uh, you know, you develop a style of living. You know, you need money like we have down south. Uh, you know, you have to have the dishwasher, you have to have your new truck every 10 years. And uh, I can see some of them, especially the younger ones, getting into that and they may follow you know, the workforce, let's say. Let's say if there's a mine opening somewhere else, they may move. They can probably move to the larger communities like uh, Fort, Fort Simpson or uh, uh, Yellowknife and, and make do. The older guys, I think they'll, like, the, the guys that I go out hunting with, they'll be fine. You know, they can carry on, they can go right back, and I, I think they'd probably be happy to. Uh, th there's, a, there's certainly a group in there, uh, say that my generation, that's caught in between, that doesn't know. Uh, and I don't know what'll happen with those guys. I guess government, the government helps them all. As with the ore, the options for the Inuit in the region are becoming exhausted. For many young Inuit workers, the future seems rootless. The prospect is of becoming migratory miners in mighty Whitey land. And the elders, even if they still have the skills and the strength, will have to seek other areas where the seals and the caribou still remain. Or the Inuit may simply become wards of the state. But there are Inuit miners here who see the old life as the negative one, who want a modern living, wherever it is. I've been going to school since I was six, and uh, I'm, I got very little knowledge of the traditional life. I mean, I can, I can hunt, but I, I don't think I can make a living just uh, hunting. I know there's some people who feel that they can revert back to the uh, old way of life, but I, as far as I can see for the future, there's it's almost next to impossible to just live the old traditional way of life, so I have to, to take things as they come. The people that have worked here They've gained something in terms of experience uh, in that they've, they've had an opportunity to work in a southern industrial environment and they've made the choice whether or not they've wanted to work here or not and, uh, and many of them come here and just cannot assimilate and leave short periods of time, six weeks, eight weeks, and others come and stay for many, many years. There's community here but no common goal. Unlike the Inuit workers, few southerners stay for long. No, I, I don't think I could settle here. I, and I, I think it was a good opportunity to see another culture and to, and to see the Arctic, you know, but it's a hard life and I, I don't think I'm cut out for that. I like the land. Uh, it has this vastness that is, you know, makes you feel close to God. <laughs> so they say, when you get out, especially in the summertime when you, you can see for 50, 60 miles just by looking over the cliff and uh, it's really something. Nana 
Transpacific is an ultra-modern venture, but it is flawed. Success in the New North depends on the development of resources and of a permanent local community going hand in hand. Many of the government departments have been discussing how they will use Nanosiver. There's also been talk about the new icebreaker working out of Nanosivic as a base. Maybe they'll just move all the buildings over to Arctic Bay. Of course, there's a few radicals that say that Nanosivic's going to become the capital of the Eastern Arctic, move some of the people from Frobisher Bay up here, and also could become a forces base. So these are all things that have been kicked around uh, and rumored. We won't know until 1992. Nanosivic, a marvel, but not a vision. Frobisher Bay, South Baffin Island, is culturally upbeat. It's a government town and a global model in some respects. In the field of communications, in the use of modern techniques to preserve and enhance native culture, Canada leads the world. Since 1961, the Inuit have tuned into the world in Inuitut. This is the good news in the Canadian Arctic. The native peoples are gaining control of the media, and they've proved that they can use it well. The local newspaper, the Nunatsiak News, now typesets by computer. People here are no longer passive recipients of southern technology. With government support, the native peoples are having their own say. But whether it's children's television, drama, or current affairs, the indigenous programming is unrivaled. That's the big hope, cultural autonomy. Visitors are encouraged to give their opinions. I think that uh, the Canadian government could learn and should learn and must learn uh, from what is happening in Greenland, what has happened in Siberia. They must learn that the best way for them, for the Southerners as well as for the Northerners, is to let the Northern people run their own lives. Thank you very much. My pleasure. 2,000 kilometers to the west, the village of Snowdrift on Great Slave Lake. Once it was said, there's no drifter like a snow drifter, because snow drift had a problem, alcohol. But now the villagers have taken control of their lives. The occasion, a great anniversary. It's the birthday of Felix Lockhart, chief of the 250 Chippewan Indians here. More significantly, it is one year since Chief Lockhart last consumed any alcohol. He recalls yesterday's snowdrift. I didn't really uh, consider myself as, as a person that was having problems with alcohol. Like I didn't uh, pass out too much in the bars or I didn't get into that much fights. Everybody else is drinking, so, uh, you know, there's, there's no problem. I mean, that's, that's what uh, I was thinking about. I was lost, he told us, and so was the community, a ruin of a place because of drink. Why the drinking? Mainly because they had lost belief in themselves. They no longer knew who they were. Chief Lockhart tells of the conversion. Somehow, we were given that, that uh, the turning point about a year ago when we all almost at one time in the fall we had lost uh, uh, two or band members, uh, one drowning and the other by uh, uh, stabbing. And again in January we had lost uh, two more uh, by uh, uh, an accident and uh, two uh, skidoos collided with each other out of control. <clears throat> and that, that, was, that was the uh, turning point, I would believe, for the community to come together and, and really uh, express ourselves as to you know, how, how evident is the damage that alcohol done to us and that uh, there's been a number of people 
uh, quite a quite a significant number that went over to uh, the Poundmaker's Lodge near Edmonton. Poundmaker is a rehabilitation center developed and run by Native peoples. Indicative of changing values, there's usually a long waiting list for admission. <laughs> Chief Lockhart came here with 20 of his band. Much of the therapy for alcoholism involves role playing, talking and acting out the problem until they understand the damage. They engage in group self-criticism. Morning group. Actually, I feel really good. I'm all rested up now. And uh, just really looking forward to today. It's hard for me because it's hard for me to express my feelings. Especially when I never expressed them before. Or thought, I thought feelings was... Uh, <coughs> feel like a cup of coffee. That's what I thought feelings were. I feel good today. I would like to welcome that gentleman over there. I've read your books, and <coughs> there was one of your books that I read. And that's where I <coughs> took interest in reading books, because before I never used to. And you got good books written out. I think uh, what I feel is something that I had no anticipation of at all. I feel a marvelous sense of peace and comfort. I came from the hotel this morning, and I was grouchy and bitchy and mean in mind. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't expecting this, and it has taken me back in time all the way to my early teens when I lived in Saskatoon and used to go out to Dundurn to look at birds. And there was an Indian reservation there, and I used to play with the kids. And they used to burn sweetgrass, and I really never understood what it was all about. Today I understand. They found the medicine of tradition. The ceremony of sweetgrass, the passing of pipes, the solace of the drums, restore contentment and dignity. The inpatients are called clients. Poundmaker's director, Pat Shirt. Well, they start off each day with sweetgrass ceremony. And that's basically a meditation and getting in touch with their higher power. And uh, basically, the sweetgrass is uh, like an incense, and they meditate with that. The other part is that they have pipe ceremonies. They have uh, uh, they have uh, sweat lodges. Again, those more in a lot of ways uh, spiritual ceremonies. But again, getting in touch with our culture. Poundmaker, though named after a Blackfoot chief, is a multicultural innovation, emphasizing early traditions in which alcohol had no part. In a lot of ways, it's uh, becoming aware that we're more than just bows and arrows, that we had a lot to contribute to this country, that we had rich values, rich traditions in the past that, uh, that uh, you know, in a sense, uh, helped us have a healthy life in the past. Snowdrift today is officially dry. Their long sleep is over. Just a couple of days ago, I was by myself at home, and I, I had the urge to cry, and I cried. And uh, I asked the Great Spirit to help me to, keep, to be sober for the sake of my children and for the sake of my people, for their future, because it is up to us to decide at the present time where our, the future for our children really lies. Now today, I think uh, there's there's a need for uh, the connection between our minds and our guts and how we feel about uh, about uh, things around us in our community. I think we're getting much closer to, to working together. People are being more open. And uh, without alcohol in this community, it, it seems like uh, people are much more happier. There, there's a light feeling in the air, and I think it's a good, healthy, healthy place for people to, to exchange uh, uh, what, whatever they have with each other. Says the chief, we have been to hell and back. In the heart of the Mackenzie Mountains, Farley Mowat seeks out a colorful individual who has a part answer to the exploitation of land and wildlife in the north. is Sam Miller. He runs Old Squaw Lodge, a place that takes some getting to. After a charter flight, there's a two-hour bone-shaking trip along the old wartime Canal Road in a unique vehicle which Sam affectionately calls the Crummy. 
But then Sam himself is pretty unusual. He's established his Wilderness Lodge, where people learn to treat the natural world with the kindness and compassion they'd want for themselves. Moet's destination, a tundra plateau 12 kilometers east of the Yukon Northwest Territory's border. It's a largely unsullied world, which Sam Miller first discovered as a government biologist. I used to do some grizzly work out here. And uh, you know, when I was working on grizzly bears here for the, uh, the government, I used to come up here to spend quite a bit of time, you know, just enjoy it. But you can see this, you know, this area is, uh, uh, is unique in the sense that it's this huge plateau which is you know, characterized by, by many Arctic features. And it, it's been known for quite some time from other biologists that this is different. And uh, when I finally resigned my position from the government, uh, I thought, well, it'd be a nice place to build a lodge where I can have people come up and enjoy a part of, the, of, the, of Canada that, that is usually not accessible to most people. These people are typical of the new users of wilderness. They are replacing the so-called sportsmen whose way of using wilderness was to turn it into a killing ground. First of all, I want to point out some of the, you know, just the, the, the layout of the ground and some of the, the names that you'll hear us using. And I guess the, the most obvious one is the ridge there, which is quite stony and has very little vegetation on it. Uh, that's called Poppy Ridge. And down below it, there is a, a fox's den on the far side of that. And one day when we were walking along there, we, we saw the, the vixen, she walked up the hill and then walked along the ridge. The people who visit Old Squaw go to a lot of trouble and pay quite a bit of money to come to a place where they can make their own connections with a living world. They're not looking at nature along the barrel of a gun. Watching nature, being a part of nature, can also be good business for native people. Nature tourists will pay as much for guides and lodging as hunters do. Okay, there they are. See them? Can I have a look? Yeah, come and see. You get them? Oh, right. Gosh, now it's the first time I've ever seen a caribou. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Let's remember that before the whites came, there was no fur trade, no killing of wildlife except for need. We brought mass destruction and not all of us agree with it. I don't feel I have the right to alter the life of these creatures. If it came to a choice of me or it, pure survival, I'm sure I would change. I'm not that altruistic. But if it's not a question of that at all, and if I can come back to the lodge and get my dinner, I don't think I have any right whatsoever to kill that caribou. Well, what would it cost me if I wanted to come up here and do that? It ranges on the number of species you wish to shoot, but you're probably looking at somewhere between six and ten thousand dollars for a two-week hunt. And uh, here in the Mackenzie Mountains, uh, that would allow you to to uh, shoot if you if you bought the entire package, you could shoot you know, uh, the dow sheep, uh, moose, uh, woodland caribou, uh, wolves, wolverine, and in some area goats. We have a different uh, philosophy on on how to use and enjoy the, you know, the wildlife that we have here. And people uh, return year after year to see the same, you know, the same animals. Uh, like they tell me, it, it's nothing like seeing them out here on their own. And, and these people go home with, with uh, a lifetime experience. In this homey setting, Sam and his friend Nan serve both as keepers of the inn and of the peace. Foremost, they are educators. Tell me something about your guests. What what uh, what are the quality? What are these people like? Who do you get here? Well, it's wonderful because I think the guests are probably as easy to accommodate as anywhere you could find because most of them simply want to see birds and flowers and get a feeling of of the north. Not looking the, for trophies. Right, mm -hmm. right. Only one in ten Canadians hunt with the gun, but they form a powerful lobby. Mowat puts their case to Sam Miller. I mean, after all, the country belongs to the whole of Canada, in theory. So why shouldn't anybody who's got a four-wheel drive vehicle that he wants to drive on Tundra uh, and a brand new Winchester with a telescopic sight that he wants to try out on a living target, I mean, doesn't he have any rights? Why shouldn't he have the same opportunities? 
Well, he has. Well, I think all people should have the right to come here. I mean, uh, no independent even of, of, of my lodge, they can come here. Mm -hmm. But I don't think nobody should have the right to uh, tear up our environment and uh, and leave it in, 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 in such a manner that, that it would be visible for the next hundred years. And I've sat out here and seen people with their, their three-wheelers tearing around in the tundra, and they like to see the mud flip up and make rooster tails with, with their, their bikes and with mm -hmm. their trucks. Uh, it's nice to come and enjoy, but, but don't leave much sign of your presence. Leaving Sam, guardian of the wilderness, there is a last stop in the new north. Across the Yukon into Alaska to a place facing toward Siberia. At the Inuit town of Katsubu, the circumpolar journey ends propitiously with mixed images of modern well-being and warnings for the common survival. The Inuit of Alaska, Greenland, and Canada have gathered in hopes of instilling a greater northern consciousness among the polar nations. Their message is eloquent and urgent. For the most part, we were isolated and left alone by the rest of the world, but uh, we cannot live in that kind of isolation anymore. We are very much a part of the global picture now. Whatever kind of self-government the native people of the Arctic wants to achieve economic self-sufficiency is essential. We are the experts of the Arctic. We know how to deal with the Arctic. We know how to preserve the Arctic and its people. It's not at all enough to defend your own interests and it's not enough at all to go out and tell the outside world how beautiful we are, how beautiful our land is. We have to be more offensive to the outside threats. This is the only way that we can ensure our survival and uh, when the Inuit are fighting to survive, they fight fairly hard. The conclusion of this circumpolar voyage leaves me with one overriding thought. If we have any survival sense, we'll put an end to the ruination of northern lands and waters and to the degradation of native northern peoples. We'll make sure the North remains a living world one that can be a source of strength to generations yet to come. A place where man can coexist in dignity and certainty with a world he cherishes and nurtures, and which in turn nurtures and cherishes him. This is what the New North must become.